Hi, this is the Mosomic Memes Microphone Guide. My name is Mikko Suvanto. In this episode, I'll talk about the acoustical implementation of Memes microphones into devices. Stay tuned! This series is sponsored by Infineon Technologies. A microphone needs a good acoustical connection to the outside air in order to let the sound in the air affect the sensor in the microphone as effectively and without restraint as possible. One way to achieve this would be to place the microphone directly on the surface of the device, but in most cases it's not desirable to have the microphone directly visible. First of all, industrial designers in charge of the appearance of the device are not likely to like the look of a microphone. Second, the microphone is more vulnerable if there's nothing to protect it from elements and abuse. Therefore, the microphone is practically always located inside the device covers, and there is a sound channel that starts on the surface of the device and ends at the acoustic sensor. An acoustically sealed channel is practically always the best solution what comes to the performance and reliability of the capturing system. This means in practice that it's an airtight tube from the surface of the device all the way to the microphone. I'll explain in a minute why it must be airtight. The sound channel can have a drastic effect on the frequency response as well as other parameters of the microphone system. Therefore, the acoustical implementation of a microphone into a device must be done carefully to minimize any negative effects the channel may have. There are two main goals for doing the acoustical implementation of a MEMS microphone into a device. The first is optimizing the dimensions of the acoustic channel. The other is stability, invariability of the acoustics. I'll talk more about stability in upcoming episodes about mechanical implementation. The whole acoustic path consists of the channel in the device mechanics and the acoustics inside the MEMS microphone in front of the membrane. The microphone acoustics in front of the membrane are, in practice, the sound port of the microphone and the front volume. In the device mechanics, the channel typically goes through a hole in the device cover, rubber sealing gaskets, and in some cases through tubes formed in the rigid parts, often made out of plastic, of the device mechanics and housing. Sound enters the microphone package through the sound port that's either on the top or on the bottom of the package. Then it goes through the front volume and reaches the acoustic sensor, in the case of a capacity microphone, a membrane. For top port microphones, the device sound channel is sealed against the top surface of the microphone package around the microphone sound port. Sometimes the sealing is done around the microphone instead of on top of it. I'll talk more about this in the episode about acoustic sealing. For bottom port microphones, sound travels to the microphone through a hole in the device circuit board. Typically, the microphone is acoustically sealed against the circuit board with a soldered sealing ring around the sound port of the microphone. On the other side of the device circuit board, the sound channel is sealed against the circuit board with a rubber sealing element. Sealing elements enable making acoustically sealed connections between different parts of the sound channel. Sealing elements are typically made out of rubber, foam or neoprene. When designing the sealing elements, it's important to make sure that the sound channel cannot be blocked or experience leaks. There are many mechanical tolerances that cause inaccuracies in the sizes and locations of the holes in the gaskets and the holes in the rigid mechanics against which the gaskets seal. To prevent blocking of the sound channel caused by the tolerances, the holes in the gaskets are typically bigger than the holes in the rigid mechanics. If the holes in the gaskets are slightly bigger than the rest of the acoustic channel, the sealing elements may form cavities in the channel, possibly resulting in a Helmholtz resonance. The acoustic channel and the device mechanics around it must be designed to be stable, so that changes in the alignments of the sealing elements can be avoided. 
The acoustic channel should be designed to optimize the acoustic performance of the microphone system. Simplifying the issue to its bare minimum, the way to achieve a wide frequency range is to have a short, wide and uniform sound channel. A wide channel means that the cross-sectional area or diameter of the sound channel is maximized. A good rule of thumb is that the length of the channel should not be more than twice its width to avoid degradation of the sound signal. In practice, a channel like that is often not possible to achieve. The width of the channel is typically limited by the maximum size allowed for the sound channel opening on the surface of the device, as well as the size and structure of the MEMS microphone, for example, the size and location of the microphone sound port. A uniform channel means that the cross-sectional area of the channel is as uniform as possible. In practice this means that cavities, air volumes, are avoided within the sound port. Also constrictions should be avoided, because cavities and constrictions together can form Helmholtz resonators. Helmholtz resonances should be avoided in order to keep the usable frequency band of the microphone system as wide as possible. However, in many cases, reaching a full audio bandwidth up to 20 kHz is not possible due to compromises in the acoustic channel design caused by limitations in the acoustical and mechanical structure of the device. The acoustics of the microphone itself play a big role in the overall acoustic channel for the microphone. I talked about the acoustics in a MEMS microphone in detail in episode 3. The area of the sound port on the microphone package should be as big as possible so that the port constricts the sound channel as little as possible. Inside the microphone, the front volume is the volume of air inside the microphone package in front of the acoustic sensor element when looking into the microphone through its sound port. If the size of the front volume is so big that it forms a cavity of significant size as compared to the cross-sectional area of the rest of the sound channel, it is likely to cause a Helmholtz resonance. If there's also a cavity in the sound channel within the device mechanics, the effect of the two cavities together can be especially harmful to the frequency response of the system. Other acoustic elements that one can find in a microphone sound channel are meshes and membranes that are used to protect the microphone from contamination such as dust and liquids. The negative effect of them is that they tend to increase the system noise level a little, depending on the properties of the protective material. They can also be used to improve the acoustics, they can dampen resonances, in other words, reduce the heights of resonance peaks, thereby improving the frequency response. Acoustic factors outside the microphone and the microphone sound channel can also affect sensitivity, frequency response and other microphone system parameters. The device housing can affect the frequency response, for example, by boosting higher frequencies. In principle, the sensitivity of the microphone system can double at some frequencies. In practice, the effect depends on a variety of factors and the actual effect may be difficult to predict. The device housing can also have a significant effect on the directionalities of the microphones built into the device. This depends on the location of the microphone and the mouth of the sound channel on the surface of the device. A mouth of a sound channel at the corner of a device is likely to result in different behavior than a sound port in the middle of a large flat area in the device cover. Typically, housing sizes close or above the wavelength of the received sound are likely to have the biggest impact. For example, the surface area of a normal-sized smartphone with a 6.5-inch display is 158 by 77 mm. 158 mm corresponds to a sound frequency lower than 2.2 kHz. 2.2 kHz isn't that far from 1 kHz, which is often considered to be the middle of the audio band. 77 mm corresponds with about 4.5 kHz. The widths of many smart speakers are similar or bigger than the iPhone XS Max, thereby affecting even lower frequencies than an iPhone. Also, like I mentioned in episode 2, 
Objects near the device can cause acoustic phenomena such as boosting, diffraction and absorption. Like I mentioned in episode 10, it's typically beneficial if the frequency responses of the microphones in a multi-microphone algorithm system are identical or at least similar. This means that also the sound channels for the microphones should be as identical as possible, assuming that the microphone components in the device are all the same or at least similar. Typically, there are many factors that affect where the microphones can be placed within a device. Therefore, matching parameters such as sound channel lengths may be challenging. If the goal is to capture ultrasound, sound above the human hearing range, 20 kHz, then the whole system must be optimized to enable this. The acoustic sensors in many MEMS microphones are suitable for capturing ultrasound. The sensor elements are small and light, so their acoustic resonance frequencies can be very high, easily tens of kilohertz. The limitations in the frequency responses are typically caused by the acoustics inside the microphone package and the acoustical properties of the device sound channel. The frequency response of a MEMS microphone plotted up to 100 kHz may show two resonances. The first one is the one caused by the device sound channel and the acoustics of the microphone that are parts of the sound channel, membrane, front volume and sound port. The second resonance hump is likely caused by the microphone acoustics behind the membrane, backplate and back volume. The requirements for the acoustic implementation naturally depend on the requirements for their frequency response at the ultrasonic frequencies. Typically, frequencies beyond 50 kHz are not used. Some systems use speakers and microphones already available in devices for ultrasonic or near-ultrasonic purposes. In this case, the highest frequencies are typically below 20 kHz so they're ultrasound only in the sense that most people can't hear them. When a microphone is implemented into a device with a sound channel in front of it, the first resonance may end up lying below or at the ultrasonic frequencies that the system is meant to capture. However, in many cases, ultrasonic applications are functionally separate from the audio frequency applications, so it's not necessary to have a continuous flat frequency response up to the ultrasonic frequencies. The acoustic system can be designed so that the used ultrasonic frequency band lies at a frequency range above the first resonance, where the response can be quite flat. To achieve a good frequency response at ultrasonic frequencies, the sound channel should be especially short and wide, or possibly designed to widen towards the mouth of the sound port. Simulations should be used, if possible, to study the effect of the sound channel. Like I said earlier, the acoustics for a microphone must be stable. Even small changes in the dimensions of the sound port can affect the frequency response and thereby perceived sound quality and algorithm performance. Therefore, the dimensions must not change throughout the lifetime of the device or vary depending on how the device is used and handled. Also, changes in the ceiling, air tightness of the channel can affect the sound signal significantly. Avoiding blocked sound ports is also critical. The locations of all the parts in the acoustic channel can vary because of manufacturing tolerances and shifts that happen over the lifetime of the device. If the assembly accuracy of the ceiling element is poor, or if the element shifts in relation to the other parts of the sound channel so that it blocks the sound path, the result is naturally severely reduced sensitivity of the system. A partially blocked sound port can affect sensitivity and cause significant changes in the frequency response of the system. It's also important to avoid acoustic leaks. An acoustic leak means that at some point between the mouth of the sound port on the surface of the device, and the microphone sound port, air is able to escape the sound channel. This can happen, for example, if there isn't enough force to press the compliant sealing gasket against the rigid mechanics against which the gasket is supposed to seal. Other causes for leaks can be misaligned sealing elements, too small sealing elements, and wrong sealing materials. 
Part of the sound signal escaping from the channel means that less of it will impact the microphone sound sensor and the sensitivity and thereby signal to noise ratio of the microphone system decreases. Low frequencies are the most likely to escape through a leak, so a leak also changes the shape of the frequency response. An acoustic leak can also let sound that's present inside the device enter the microphone sound channel. The sound can be, for example, the speakers of the device outputting content. Sound from the device speakers finding their way directly to the microphone can lead to echo problems that may, for example, prevent a duplex connection. Duplex connection means that uplink and downlink, outgoing and incoming audio signals are audible simultaneously. The loss of a duplex connection means that only one participant in the discussion can speak at a time and others can't be heard. It's a bit like talking with push-to-talk walkie-talkies. Acoustical systems such as microphones in combination with a sound channel are fairly straightforward to model. There are acoustical simulation tools that enable modeling and simulating the sound channel. This way the design can be optimized without spending a lot of time, money and effort on prototyping the designs. Simulations enable avoiding unpleasant surprises at late points in the development process. A microphone manufacturer may be able to provide their customers with acoustical models of the microphones, so that the device designer can include the microphone in the device simulation. Let's have a look at some simplified examples of sound ports, to give you a better idea of the basic principles. The best possible microphone sound channel in a device is wide and short, with a length no more than twice the width of the channel. In reality, a channel that's short or wide is rarely achievable, due to constraints set by the device mechanical structure, industrial design and so on. It's often not possible to put all the microphones in a multi-microphone device close to the surface of the device, so that their sound channels would be short and nice. However, as long as the cross-sectional area of the acoustic channel is uniform throughout its length, it can still enable achieving a good frequency response. This is doable, but usually challenging. The challenge is that, like I mentioned earlier, the holes in the ceiling elements often have to be made bigger than the holes with which they should coincide. This is required to minimize the risk of partial or complete blockage of the channel. These wider parts in the channel are practically cavities that, together with the acoustic tubes that are unavoidable in an acoustic channel, form Helmholtz resonators that limit the usable frequency range of the system. The performance achievable with a channel like this depends on the dimensions of the tubes and cavities in relation to each other. The key goal is to minimize the sizes of the cavities and their quantity. If the quantity of the cavities cannot be kept to one, the risk of significant deterioration of the frequency response increases. If the front volume of the microphone is large, meaning that there is a relatively large cavity in the sound port within the microphone itself, it becomes increasingly difficult to achieve a good response. Also, a very small sound port on the microphone package makes things unnecessarily challenging. The more complicated the mechanical and acoustical structure of the device is, the more emphasis should be put on finding a microphone that enables achieving the best possible performance within the design constraints of the device. Okay, that's it for this episode. In the next one, I'll continue talking about acoustical implementation. That one will be about acoustic ceiling. I hope I'll see you around. Cheers! If you have any comments or questions, write them down in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. You can also contact me online or on social media. If you like what you saw here, give a like for the video and subscribe to the Mosomic channel. That way you help me reach more people and thereby create more content. If you need more in-depth microphone training than what you saw here, contact me and we can arrange it. The training can be adapted to suit any interests and skill levels, and the customer can choose the location and duration of the course. Mosomic provides also consultation services in all things related to MEMS microphones.
If you're a microphone buyer, I can help you select the right components for your product and manage your microphone suppliers. I can also assist in implementing the microphones into your device. For microphone manufacturers, I provide microphone marketing, product definition, product management and development management services. I can also help you create all kinds of MEMS microphone documentation, 